All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Portland Audubon's Wild Arts Festival panel discussion. We're going to give folks just a few minutes to tune in, and then we'll start more formally with a program overview and introductions. Give it just a couple minutes. It's 11.01. Give it just another minute. I'll start it at 11.02. You guys are good with that. All right, let's get going. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Tricia Sears, and I'm a member of the Wild Arts Festival Book Fair Committee for Portland Audubon. Welcome to this author panel. We're so glad that you could join us. During the panel, the audience can submit questions through the chat feature on Zoom. We encourage you to ask questions, and we'll try to take some as we go, as Zoe and Molly are talking, um, but there may also be questions at the end. So we'll just kind of go with the flow today, see how it goes. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce the panelists next. Just a brief introduction. All right. Zoe Burke has been part of the Wild Arts Fair since 2018. A Portland author, Zoe has cleverly composed rhymes for several children's books, including the wonderful board book primer, Charlie Harper's Count the Birds. <clears throat> Zoe and artist Molly Hashimoto teamed up to produce Molly's Birds, season by season, and Molly's Trees, both delightful books for children. Most recently, the two have joined, have jointly produced a fun-filled activity book, Molly Hoshimoto's Art and Nature Activity Book. The book contains creative fun for kids of all ages with puzzles, games, language builders, and art projects. The stunning illustrations help to promote creative thinking and play. In her day job, Zoe Burke is the vice president and publisher of Pomegranate Communications, an art book publishing company. Molly Hashimoto has been part of the Wild Arts Fair since 2017. She is a talented printmaker and watercolor artist with an eye for beauty of the natural world. Her stunning book, Birds of the West, an artist's guide, continues to be a special book for artists and nature lovers. Molly's book, Colors of the West, an artist's guide to nature's palette, teaches how to observe, sketch, and paint nature en plein air. A recent project for Molly is her Birds 2021 wall calendar. The calendar has 12 monthly grids and reflects Molly's easy closeness to nature with full color artwork of birds found alongside streams and in the desert. Along with her art, teaching continues to be an important part of Molly's artistic journey. She's passionate about connecting people to nature and cultural history through hands-on art experience and has taught outdoor seminars at the Cent excuse me, Sitka Center for Art and Ecology on the Oregon coast the North Cascades Institute in North Cascades National Park, and the Yellowstone Institute in Yellowstone National Park. We do encourage you to check out the author pages online at the Wild Arts <clears throat> Festival website, wildarts.org. And now I'll let Molly and Zoe take it, take it away. Thanks, Tricia. Thank you. Well, Molly, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you since the Wild Arts Fair last year, right? Yeah, I think that's true. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it's been quite a year, eh? 
Yes, yes, indeed. So that's my first question. Given everything going on in the world, have how how has that affected your creative juices? Have you been able to make art? Because I have not been able to write. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, at the beginning, I found it very difficult. Um, I had a new book project that I was working on. I'm doing a book about Mount Rainier National Park. And so in June, I had to get real courageous and go down to Mount Rainier, you know, braving people who weren't wearing masks, et cetera, mm -hmm. <laughs> and hiking alone, encountering a bear, seeing animals that I would never see normally because there weren't any people there. So the animals, as I've, as I've heard from rangers, the animals were having a real party before they opened the parks again. So I went right after they opened. And I will say that the, the two trips I took to Mount Rainier really uh, got my creative juices flowing because you just can't go outside especially in a wild place without seeing something that just shifts your whole mental outlook and I you know it almost made me forget about what a difficult year it has been yeah so I have to ask what did you do when you encountered a bear well I was on the west side road at Rainier and on one side with the cliffs of Mount Wow a bunch of mountain goats up there on the other side was uh, Tahoma Creek. There was no place to go. <laughs> so I just stood there and waited until the bear got tired of looking at me. And the, oh bear, the bear went up the, partially up the cliff, you know, not really a cliff, but you know, it was rather steep. And so, yeah, worked out fine. Wow. Um, so then did you make a print of that bear? <laughs> I intend to. I absolutely intend to. I did a little watercolor sketch and it was neat because it was a cinnamon face, not the usual black bear. So if you were a total novice, you know, you'd go, whoa, is that a grizzly? Because, you know, it, it was a little grizzled too, but only black bears at Rainier. So if it had been a grizzly, wow, that would have been a little different. <laughs> I guess, I guess. So Zoe, how about you? You know, what what gets your juices flowing and what what penetrated the you know the the haze of the pandemic for you well because i'm also the publisher at pomegranate I, um we've stayed open during all of this and i have things that i have to do every day and that's been very helpful <clears throat> and i'm grateful that i can go into the office and i'm not stuck at home our building is big enough so that we have we're very safe in terms of distancing and we've put in extra fans and ventilation and we all wear masks and you know all of that stuff so it's, it's good to be able to go to work and instead of working on my because i also try to I've, I've had some mysteries published and i have a mystery languishing in my computer that is going nowhere um but instead of you know, beating myself up about not working on that. I do have my publishing duties. So, you know, that's been really good for me. Um, and in terms of my children's writing that I've done with your art and also with um, Charlie Harper's art and with the printmaking studios up in Cape Dorset, the Inuit prints, I've, I've done some, uh, I did a board book with that art. That inspiration comes from the art, you know, it really does. And um, I love that being publisher at Pomegranate, I have this wealth of imagery to think about in terms of what could I do, what can we do with this um, beyond, you know, the calendar or the note cards or whatever we've already done. And so um, I start, uh, Charlie's, Charlie Harper's work was, it was very fun to do that. And then because you're such, Molly, you're such a longstanding, best-selling artist for Pomegranate, it was obvious for me to think, well, we got to do something with Molly's great work. So um, that's how these projects started. Um, I also say in terms of my inspiration as a, as a rhyming writer, my grandmother, uh, when I was a little girl, she would write to, she would write me letters in verse and I would write back to her in verse. I mean, and my verses were like, you know, look at you over there, I'm sitting here in a chair or something. I mean, they wouldn't really like make any sense, but it, it just established that 
rhyming thing in me. And then my parents, we were a musical family, so there was a lot of music going on. And whenever there was an occasion for, a, you know, a birthday, an anniversary, friends, family, whatever, they would take a well-known tune and write new lyrics to it and present it at whatever the party was. So I had all of that going on in my, in growing up, you know, which, and, and I've, I've written some songs and stuff too. So it, a lot of what I've done in the, in the rhyming children's book comes from that, mm -hmm. uh, from my family. Yeah, yeah. Well, so when you're out <clears throat> walking around and encountering birds and beasts, you, you always sketch, do you ever use photography as a, as a starting point for your prints or not? Absolutely. Um, you know, back many years ago, I would be with people who would, would never have tolerated me sitting around drawing, you know, it's like, get going. We got to get to this, you know, summit or the destination. So right. <clears throat> I've been taking pictures all my life and I, I don't, I'm not a professional or anything. I have, um, you know, I've got a Canon. I've got two different cameras and they both have a real good zoom on them so I can get pretty close to wildlife without, and, you know, without worrying them. So a lot of times uh, I'll get back from something and I will synthesize from different photos I've taken to create, <laughs> to create the art. So a lot of the plein air work that I do is done when I'm teaching the classes because oftentimes I'm with people that don't want to stop while I draw. And, right. so, that makes and sense. then, you know, there are some disadvantages to plein air work. You can run into a lot of heat, wind, snow, rain, you name it. But I do sometimes get a, a sketch started and I make notes about things like the light direction and uh, the colors are really important. It's pretty hard for a camera to, to really get lighting and color quite right. So uh, yeah, anyway, I do use photography a great deal. Very important. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask, this is kind of a, I don't know, this question might be silly, I guess, but were you first I mean, a naturalist or were you first an artist? I mean, how did those two things come together? Did you start off one and then discover the other or were they kind of synthesized from the beginning? Um, that's a great question, Zoe. Um, I was always an artist as a little kid. I made cartoons about my family. And I think as children and as teenagers, I've noticed this in my teaching, there's a real fascination with little kids with animals. Then as you become a teenager with the human face and form, and that goes on into your 20s, this, this applied to me as well. And then in your 30s, you begin to, your vision begins to enlarge and includes things like birds and anim, more animals again, and landscapes for sure. I've been on trips with children and I've noticed that for children, a landscape sometimes doesn't, it doesn't really amount to anything in their imaginations. They're more focused on individual parts of the landscape. So that kind of describes my journey. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Cool. Yeah. So <clears throat> I want to refer to a couple of my questions. Um, I'm wondering when Pomegranate was founded, when your company oh. was founded. Yeah, 1968. Um, my husband, Thomas Burke, started the company as a poster distribution company in San Francisco when all the head shops were happening in the Haight-Ashbury and and um, <clears throat> he would buy posters and uh, roll them in this kitchen table and put them in the trunk of his car and drive and, and sell them to the head shops in the Haight-Ashbury. That's how we got started. And then he started publishing his own posters, started as a publishing company of the um, contemporary um, visionary artists of the Bay Area. And these posters were three by two feet, which is full of, I mean, amazing art. Um, it then, he was one, Pomegranate was one of the first companies, I know this sounds crazy, but one of the first companies 
to produce note cards that didn't say anything inside. You know, in the 70s, you bought a note card that said happy birthday inside or had a verse inside. Pomegranate's cards were all about presenting the art. And I remember when I started working at the company in the early 70s, we would get phone calls and people would say, well, I, I see that you have these cards, but they don't say anything inside. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? And I would say, well, you can put whatever you want inside. So anyway, um, and then published the first book in 1970s, hmm, late 70s, published our first calendar, I think for the year 1976, 77, something like that. So now we publish um, all of those things, note cards and and calendars and books. And uh, our latest very successful product category is Jigsaw Puzzles, which frankly has kept us in business during the pandemic because it's a great inside, you know, lockdown kind of um, uh, occupation. So yeah, so that's, that's how that all happened. Yeah, you know, I was uh, looking through my pomegranate file, which is about three inches thick, because we've been working together for so long. I wanted to find my first letter from you because I save all that stuff. Wow. And there was a letter from 1989. So that means that I've been working with you for 31 years, which is pretty cool. It's very cool. And yeah. it's been such a success. I mean, you're your work really is is timeless, I think, and I think it appeals to all the different ages. So yeah, we're we're so delighted with all of that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Zoe. You know, I was thinking back on one of the first cards you ever published. I tried to dig it up. I couldn't find it, but it was a woman in this kind of uh, multicolored kimono looking out a window and onto a scene outdoors and. I was just thinking how, you know, that hasn't really changed over the years. It's always the person looking, looking out to the outdoors. Yeah. And, and I wanted to ask you, are there activities that you find are really rejuvenating for you that may have nothing at all to do with your art or your, or your work at Pomegranate or even your writing? Are there some activities that just really send you? Swimming. Aha. Uh -huh. I have written lots swimming laps. Um, <laughs> I know it's crazy, but maybe if it, I've at least come up with ideas swimming laps. I find it very meditative. Um, I did a series for Pomegranate, um, the Charlie Harper Nature Discovery Series. Charlie Harper did these, these huge posters for national parks and they have tons of animals and bugs and everything in them. And I wanted to do something um, with those. And, and I came up with the idea of taking, of silhouetting every single creature in those and, and um, make, writing a story. Like one is um, what's in the woods, you know, and it's all about you, you walk through the woods and you discover all of these creatures. And then at the end, there's a fold out of the whole poster with a key. So you can go back and find them all in there. And I came up with that idea swimming laughs. <laughs> So yeah, um, really funny. I like that. Yeah, I think it's just when you when when you're doing a an activity like you say that takes you out of your your normal routine. For me, that can really help. Um, and also, I found when I've worked on my mysteries, um, having jazz in the background. I don't know why, but it helps a lot. So. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, the water element, I was going to say, I've heard this a lot from other people, but when I'm taking my morning shower, I, I get the most, you know, I don't know where it comes from, but it must just be the feeling of water on your skin. Maybe <laughs> water is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, water is the answer. So I was thinking one time you told me that you just love going to movie theaters and I the last movie theater the last movie I saw was Knives Out that was last last holiday season <laughs> and I was I was just writing an email to a friend saying oh my gosh the idea of going to a movie theater and watching a movie what a lovely idea but yeah. I I find movies 
movies really inspire me and read, reading novels and nonfiction. I find that real inspiring. Um, right now I'm reading Underland by Robert McFarlane, a fabulous book about caves and all the underlands of the world. Wow. And uh, I'm reading another really compelling novel called The Abstainer by Ian McGuire. Fantastic. Wow. Great. So how about you, Zoe? What are you reading? I'm reading, I'm reading um, The Soul of the Octopus, which I know everyone has read like five years ago, but I never did. So I'm enjoying that. And I just read Ann Patchett's The Dutch House, hmm. which is her latest. She's a, she's a wonderful writer. I'm a big fan of hers. So Molly, can you tell us a little bit about how you make your your block prints what what sure. what's the process what's your technique i'm glad you asked that question because i thought we might talk about it so i brought out a few of the materials that i use so i'll come up with a drawing and the drawing has to be pretty pretty solid you know pretty well developed and i take the drawing and Although I have done woodblock prints and I really, really admire them, um, they are very, very time consuming and they can be a little hard on your wrist. So I discovered this material called Safety Cut and it's a pretty stiff, I think it's you know some kind of plasticky material. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but it's really good. It holds up well to carving and it's not too slick. So anyway, I start with something like this And this is the uh, 2021 calendar that you're publishing. Yeah, which unfortunately I think is out of stock. <laughs> we might have two or something, but. Anyway. Okay, well, it's probably online somewhere. One yeah, of those. probably is, yep. And anyway, so this is the, this is the carved print. Wow. So you go from this to the carved print and you can see it's kind of gray because I've inked it up. Um, I use uh, Charbonnel, it's a French company. I use their etching ink and it's an oil-based ink, really lovely. Gives you some very nice rich blacks and I use a brayer and spread it out, spread the ink out on the plexiglass and uh, then I lay a paper on the print, press very hard. This is all done in my home and I don't have a press and it is not necessary. I just use a spoon. This is one thing I really like about it. And I've noticed uh, during the, the course of the last eight months, a lot of printmakers have gone back to this real kitchen table type printmaking because they don't have access to the printmaking studios. You know, if they're collectives, you can't really use them right now. Right. So anyway, the kitchen table, that's how these things are made. And, and I think it's pretty cool. I've taught it many times and people really, really, I notice them taking off and doing really good work with it in, in that pretty short order. So this is what the print looks like before I tint it. So you could conceivably carve uh, several different prints and um, different blocks and ink them in different colors. But one thing that I really like doing since I started out as a watercolor artist is painting them and tinting them in watercolor. And it gives me the option of trying different colors. So I've done a couple of prints where I had different seasons. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's what it looks like before I painted. And, and I just wanted to show you real quickly Sometimes I'll do something both as a watercolor and as a print. And you can express different things in watercolor and in printing, which is the reason I started doing printmaking because I couldn't say everything I wanted to with, with uh, watercolor. But this is, this is a green heron that I saw kind of near my house in Seattle. And that's the watercolor. And this is the block print. And you can That's see, wonderful. yeah, they have a very different character. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Your, your watercolors are exquisite, Molly. 
as well as your prints. We have a question. Um, some um, Anne, hi Anne. Anne Littlewood wants to know the name of your material again that you use for the carving. Safety cut with a K. <laughs> can, can you spell it? Sure. Safety, as in safety. Oh, pants. safety. Oh, safety. I didn't understand. Okay. And cut. K U T T. K U T. Safety cut. Okay. Great. Um. Yeah, I, what I like about all of that is it feels kind of retro. You know, you don't need you don't need fancy machines or anything to do that, make prints like that. And that's really nice. It's 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 um it's available, you know, to people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that idea. And something else that I've always really liked about printmaking is that. Oil paintings are for a collector market, you know, people who have really a lot of money, but most people can afford to buy a print because, you know, there are multiple copies and I, I find it a very, uh, what's the word, democratic? <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word, but available to all, both to well, make them and buy them. I think that's one of Pomegranate's missions too, is to, well, I don't think, I know it's one of our missions is to put out high quality art paper gifts that people can afford, you know, um, because art, frankly, we need it. We need it so badly and uh, everyone should have access to art. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten an email from someone who has told me that I saved this calendar for years. I have the pictures up on my wall. And I just think that is so cool. I mean, that's better than somebody buying something for me. The idea that they value this thing that they were able to afford and that they still appreciate it years after. I have a whole shelf of calendars that I cannot possibly get rid of. <laughs> Not mine, other people. We have some other questions. Um, let's see, about your watercolor do you molly do you press onto watercolor paper for the tinting uh good question you know there was a, a paper mill in italy uh, magnani and unfortunately they went out of business because i used to use their pescia paper which was perfect for my uh, purposes but i had to go to arches hot press watercolor paper which works pretty well but it buckles a little bit more right great question okay and then there's a question for me of how does pomegranate select the artists we work with? Well, um, there's a team of about four of us who are um, we're kind of online for various reasons, or we decide to go, we hear about an artist and we go to the website and we check it out. Um, uh, there's lots of ways to be discovering artists. Um, we do have um, people submit their artwork and to be, perfectly honest, most of the time, there's, no, there's not something there that's suitable for us. Not to say it's bad art or ridiculous, although frankly, sometimes we get some of that into. But, um, we, but we do have a submissions policy that's right on um, our, uh, our homepage at the bottom. You can find your way to that if you want to submit. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's happens. A lot of times it's happenstance. Um, and so there's a team of us, we're always looking and then we get together and we look at, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And, you know, most of the time we agree um, because we are all working for the same company and we're all sharing the same mission. But Molly, I asked you this question recently because I couldn't remember how you first came to us. So that's a good, so tell that story because that was a kind of a happenstance thing. Sure. Many years ago, I worked for Elliott Bay Books. Um, I was an English major. And, you know, what do you do when you're an English major, when you grow up? Well, you can work for a bookstore. And I worked, <laughs> I worked there when Walt Carr owned it. So this was quite a while ago. And I was the children's book buyer, the um, calendar and poster and uh, note card buyer. So I came in contact with Pomegranate's work quite early on. And they had a fabulous sales rep, Shauna. She Shana was Gordon, yeah. wonderful. And 
she, I, I told her I was an artist. She used to visit the store to, you know, show me the new pomegranate products. And I told her I was an artist and I showed her some of my work and she liked it. And she said, why don't you send it to Katie Burke and see what she says? And so I did. And that, that was uh, 1989. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to talk. So we've talked a little bit about trees, which is this book. Um, and again, I, I just was looking at Molly's art and thinking, what, what's a board book? And this, this came after birds. We had already done birds, which is the same format. And um, the very first verse is, did you ever sit under a tall tree and wonder how old it could be? And that just came to me, you know, looking at one of your, your images. And then I thought, okay, then it's gonna be all these questions about trees. So the verses are, you know, the end with how high can it be? Um, you know, is, is its bark smooth as silk and white as fresh milk or brown as iced tea? Because I was thinking, what can I do with the white bark? So that was that was really fun to do. But this other project we've been talking about, the other thing I grew up with in my family was a huge bunch of puzzle doers, all kinds of puzzles. And I've always loved puzzles, crossword puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, word puzzles, you name it. And um, you know, it, it came to me at Pomegranate, what other kinds of kids' products could we do? And I started looking into activity books. There's a lot of them out there, and a lot of them are huge, like they have like way too many pages. I mean, if I was a kid, I'd be, you know, this, I'm not taking this on. So um, this was really fun to do with Molly um, because you also, the kids also learn about all the, the, the animals and trees and plants that are in here. And we also are, um, one of our designers at Pomegranate came up with this way to make bird finger puppets, which was really terrific. I love that. That was a great, that was really a fun project to do with you. Um, here's, oh, here. Oh, I just got a, um, can you tell or show us pages of the activity book? And what ages is it most appropriate for? And is it being sold in Brooklyn anyway? Hi, Sally. God, how nice. Um, word games. Um, what's what we have, um, you know, match. You have to find the two images that match. We've got a crossword puzzle. Um, we have things like finish the picture where we took out backgrounds from Molly's painting and you've got to put in the background. Um, this is a um, what's hidden in the grid so you have to copy each square into the corresponding numbered square over here and then the picture will emerge. Um, so oh and um, story time fill in the words to make uh, the story make sense. Um, alphabet, name all the letters, and uh, come up with a name of an animal for each letter of the alphabet. So there's a lot of different, you know, connective dots and lots of different going on. In terms of the age group, I have to say, as a children's book writer, I've basically been clueless about age groups. <laughs> I've just sort of winged it. But um, uh, our CEO has young children. And I showed him this and he said, you know what's good about this? He says, is it, it runs, it's not specific to one uh, limited age group. He said, this is good for kids who are siblings in different ages to work on it together. And, um, and I hadn't even thought of that, but he was all for it. So I trusted him and it's done really well. We, we also did a Charlie Harper activity book. Is it being sold in Brooklyn anywhere? I, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, Sally, but um, we'll, we'll, I, I can check that out for you when I'm back in the office. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add, add something. Um, the birds book, I get really fun emails from people about the things that they have encountered and bought and, um, Someone sent me a video of her grandson with this page of the woodpecker open. In autumn, a woodpecker drums with its beak. And this little, he was an infant really. And he was using his, his the hand to tap on the book. Oh and I God. just thought that was so sweet. I loved it. I saved that one. That's really sweet. Yeah. All right, David Rosen. Hello, David. Uh, what kind of changes have you been seeing in the art being produced locally or globally in response to the pandemic? 
Um, I don't, I'm not sure there's been any major changes in the kind of art being produced. I mean, I think everyone who is in the business of producing art one way or another is still doing, doing what they know. I think there's been limits on how much can be produced and how we can, you know, as a publisher, how we can sell things, um, which is why our business recently has been all about jigsaw puzzles and very little else, which is, which is on the one hand, great. So glad we have jigsaw puzzles. On the other hand, it's like, wow, when are we gonna, you know, when's the rest of our business gonna, gonna come up? But I'm not complaining, we're very, very lucky. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my answer to that. <laughs> David, that was a hard question, David. Molly, which Char Charbonnel black ink is your favorite? That's from Stephanie. Yeah, I got it out. I have to look at it to make sure I'm telling you the right thing. I'm pretty sure it's the ivory black. Yeah, I don't know where it went, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the ivory black, which is kind of weird. That's an oxymoron, but yeah. it, it's ivory black. Ivory black. Hmm. Um, Zoe, what led you to writing for children's books? And like your work, Molly Hashi, when did you start? People can order it from your site, right? Um, yes, you can, you, can, you can buy all of Molly's stuff direct from Pomegranate's site. What led me to write children's books? Again, I'll go back to my grandmother um, um, writing letters to me in, in verse. Um, and then I, I, let's see, this was in the, in the 90s, early 90s. I don't really know what got me onto it, but I decided I was going to try to write some children's books and um, wrote a se several and then sent one off called uh, Lightning Bug Thunder to a few publishers. One of them was Firefly Publishing in Canada. <laughs> which we, they used to be our distributor at Pomegranate. So I knew him and I had sent it to him just to get advice. And he said, wow, we're Firefly. And you just sent this lightning bug thunder. That was kind of smart. So he published it. He, he had an artist, he hired an artist to illustrate it. And that was in late nineties, I guess. Um, and that didn't sell for beans. I mean, it was a complete disaster, although I love the book. Um, and then at, in, in Pomegranate, we, we didn't publish children's stuff for a long, long time because we didn't feel like we had any experience in it. And then I thought, well, just like everything Pomegranate does, we're going to do it the Pomegranate way, you know. And um, because of the art, we have access to it. It's worked out really well for us, all our children's books and, and coloring books and you know, the activity. And we have games now. We have a Spot the Birds board game that's based on Charlie Harper art, which has done very well. Um, yeah. So it was just, I don't, I, I've always, the first thing I wanted to be in my life as a little girl was a bed maker. The first time I made my bed, I was so excited. I, I announced that when I grew up, I was going to be a bed maker. The next thing I wanted to be was a writer. And that was because of Little Women by Louisa May Alcott, which I've heard from so many women writers that that was, that was their uh, first inspiration. That was true for me too, so. Um, Anne asks, a black pigment used to be made from burning scraps of real ivory, hence the name. Ah. Thank you. We learned I'm something sad to here. think about that though. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think that's all the questions I've seen. So Molly, what's next for you? Um, well, I have lots of prints to make. Um, I have a lot of ideas. And I, I'm working on a book about trees, doing some research really want to get down to California. Um, not sure whether that's going to happen, but I'm sort of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So, and how about you? What's next for you? Um, <laughs> I have no idea. I do want to get back to my mystery, but I, I, I'm also not going to 
you know, it'll, I'll get back to it when I get back to it. I can't, I can't force it right now. Um, I have another question though. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I think you had told me you were working on a biography too. Is that? Oh, oh yes. I have a dear friend, Claudia DeMonte, who's a, a New York sculpture artist, a feminist, wonderful, amazing woman. And she's lived such a huge life. And I suggested to her that she should write a memoir. And then I, I said, foolishly said, why don't I help you do that? Having never written a memoir or anything like it before. So she and I have now collaborated on this for a couple of years, and I don't know really if it's a if it's a book to be published or not. I'm waiting to hear back from an agent friend of mine just to get some, you know, feedback on it. So that might go. So, but that was a really interesting project, and I now have enormous respect for anyone who tries to take on a memoir. Oh my God, it's it's so hard. Mm. Um, here's a question: When did you know you were an artist? Oh, good question. Oh, I guess probably I was about 11 years old. The cartoons about the family. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cool, yeah. cool. And what, what will be the focus of that next tree book? Well, I'm thinking that it's going to be a companion volume to the Birds of the West book. So I'm gonna be uh, talking about a lot of the species, our native trees in the West and you see a lot of those trees already in this uh, trees book. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, you know, I was really kind of surprised, Zoe, about how well the trees note cards did mm. for you. You know, they were a companion to the birds note cards. And mm. I used to think that I was, you know, a little weird because I've loved trees my whole life. And I thought, well, you know, yeah, everybody loves birds, but maybe not everybody loves trees. But I think that's been proven to be not true because, you know, like the overstory, the Richard Powers novel and um, the secret life of trees or the hidden life of trees, you know, it's, it's something that apparently a lot of people are genuinely interested in. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Is there a puzzle with Molly's artwork? The thing about Molly's artwork we did have a hundred piece puzzle, but I think that's all gone now, <clears throat> you know, in the little tin. Mm -hmm. I've tried and tried to make one of your images work as a big puzzle. And because of their size and the, and the, sort of your technique and your style, it just doesn't seem to work big, you know? Um, and if you have an idea about that anytime, Molly, you let me know because I would love to do that. But so far I just haven't found the right image that would work for a 300 or a 500 or a, thousand piece puzzle um well if you know i do jigsaw puzzles and i absolutely love charlie harper i have all of his jigsaw puzzles the ones you've published and and i can't when i had there are certain puzzles where that make me want to scream and i think if you made a puzzle with my blog prints those would be the kind that would make me want to <laughs> <laughs> like throw the puzzle down on the floor and say, no, no, I can't do this. Um, here's a question. How about a blank journal with Molly's artwork? We aren't publishing blank journals right now. We did for a while and then we stopped because there's like four gazillion of them out there. And once a store is committed to a line of journals, we found it really hard for them to take a chance on a new ones. But, but I, I like it that you brought that up and it's something we always reconsider. We do have a um, sketchbook with Molly's work. Um, we call it the Young Naturalist Sketchbook Book. So mostly geared toward young people to go out and start doing some plein air sketching when they're, when they're outside. Um, I've, I've gotten some really cool um, drawings through email from kids who brought their nice. natural sketchbook outside. It was really fun. Oh, because I love that. They don't always copy anything that's on the page, you know, that's got my art. They, uh, they come up with their own ideas, which is really cool. And have you, since in-person classes aren't possible for a while, have you given any thought to online classes? Oh, yes. I've been doing them. I did one for North Cascades Institute. I did one for the Wenatchee River Institute. I did one for Bellevue Botanical Garden. And 
you know, I really miss my students. I love teaching and uh, I like helping people discover their own style and it's just great fun for me. So yeah, I, uh, virtual teaching really is not, <laughs> well, as we all know, it's far from ideal, but it's better than nothing. Right, right, absolutely. And um, uh, can I talk about the process of turning a piece of art into a puzzle? Well, it starts with an excellent, large, high quality digital photo photograph. Um, and that is um, reproduced on a piece of paper, which is glued to cardboard, which then goes through, um, uh, oh God, what do you call it? Well, it's this press that's got the die line in it and it stamps it down. Um, and then it comes off of this machine and all the puzzles fall apart into what, uh, you know, a bag or a box or whatever they fall into. It's tricky because it's easy to, for pieces to get stuck up in the, I'm calling, I'm not coming up with the word, with the stamping thing, <laughs> thingamajob. Um, so, but we're, we're, a lot of that has to do with the thickness of the board. So you can't have it too thick and you can't have it too thin. And so it's all about the, the quality of the materials, but I think we've got it down now. <laughs> and someone else suggested a birding journal. We have one birding journal at Pomegranate, which is Audubon. And um, yeah, that's a nice idea. I have to, I have to see what, how we're doing. Yeah, thanks for that idea. Who knows? How much control do we have over the shape of puzzle pieces, or is it a, we we um, we have lots of control over the shape of puzzle pieces? We basically make our own die line for the um, the die to be made. We use the same die for all of the puzzles that are the same size. You know, so if it's twenty by twenty five and it's a thousand piece, that's what's used for all of the puzzles in that in that size range. Um, but no, you really can't, really doesn't help you put all those together. I had someone accuse us of that. Well, you, it's the same, you know, you can just put them all together then. I'm like, no, you can't, no. <laughs> it's all different images. <laughs> so I think, I think that's it, Trisha, is that right? Are we there? We are there. I've got 1147 on the clock here, so. Okay. Um, that's all the time we've we've uh, got today. I think this has been fascinating. Thank you, ladies, for this wonderful dialogue. I've really enjoyed it. I'm sure the audience has too, and you've really generated a lot of questions from folks. So, um, very good job. It was um, and it's great fun for me, and I'm sure Molly too. So, yes, thank, thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Tricia. And I want to be sure to thank Sally, who just told me there was a really good piece in the New York Times about the connection between birds and uh, nature. So I will, and trees, and I will check that out. Thank you, Sally. Oh, cool. And we did have one, per, I'll just mention, one person did email and ask if they can get a copy of the recording. So I might mention that if that is something folks want, you wanna reach out to Audubon about that. Um, and I wanna encourage everyone to continue to visit the wildartsfestival.org uh, website throughout the week. It continues, our festival continues until November 22nd with lots of amazing art and books. And I'm hoping everyone goes shopping right after this session, right? Because I'm so inspired by all the things that you have. Um, and uh, again, thank you everyone. And um, oh yeah, the other thing I should mention is there are some videos on uh, the artist and author pages on the website too. So if you want some more conversations and insights to authors and artists, you can find them online. Anyway, um, oh yes, there is also a silent auction that you can find online as well. So just a wealth of things for people to do online these days. But yeah. thanks so much again for sharing your time and insights. Really appreciate it. Take Thank care. you. Thank you very much.